Sean is at shclark at kingcounty.gov, and Dr. Lewis is at jameslewis at kingcounty.gov. Um, so Lenny, just real quick, there's no S on the on the James. So we'll uh, um, we'll fix that uh, before it goes to YouTube. Well, we'll be sure to add the S. Oh no 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 no, there really is no S. Oh, they, uh, that's the that's right there, James. So the Lewis. slide is accurate. <laughs> Gotcha. Yes. I would like to welcome you this morning to another age friendly live event. My name is Lenny Orlov. I use he, him, his pronouns, and I will be your host today on age friendly Seattle civic coffee hour. Today, we're going to meet two people from public health, Seattle and King County. We'll meet Shauna Clark and James Lewis, MDP, MPH. And we'll uh, also get a brief update from the Seattle Public Library. First though, uh, I would like to uh, offer thanks to the land that we're on here in the city of Seattle. Uh, at Seattle Human Services, we acknowledged that we are on the traditional land of the first people of Seattle, the Duwamish people, past and present. We honor with gratitude the land itself and the Duwamish tribe. We want to invite you to visit www.duwamishtribe.org and we'll post that link in the chat of the live Q&A to learn more about the Duwamish, people of the inside, people who are still here, and find out how you can get involved. And uh, we, we do thank you for that. If we could go on to the next slide, please. Today in the virtual studio, uh, I'm joined by a number of folks uh, from the uh, Human Services Department here at the city of Seattle. And um, there is uh, Gita Hamam, Meg Wolf, Michael Taylor Judd, Justin England, and Jody Wong. You, you may or may not be seeing them on camera today, but you should know that they are working behind the scenes. If you would like to use captions in the following languages, Arabic, Chinese, also English, Korean, Russian, Spanish, and Vietnamese, you, you first click the gear uh, and then then the captions in languages that I listed off can be selected. Uh, if you have any questions that go beyond what will be presented here today, um, or you know anything that we at the City of Seattle Human Services Department can answer, we encourage you to connect with uh, a network of community organizations called Community Living Connections. That phone number is 1-844-348-5464. Uh, and uh, their website is communitylivingconnections.org. Well, with that, uh, before moving on to our next uh, presenter, I, uh, next slide, please. I would like to invite you to come back. Uh, we want you to save the date, which is the 5th of August. Uh, will be joined by Ann Forrest and possibly others uh, from Seattle Emergency Hubs. Uh, and uh, it's a return a visit by Ann. Uh, she, she gave us an update um, as part of another close to home presentation last year uh, uh, in, in terms of, you know, how can you prepare for an emergency during a pandemic? And so we'll get an update on that uh, she'll, she'll do more of a full presentation uh, this time around. Uh, and, and by the way, if you want to check out uh, uh, Anne's previous presentation, uh, go ahead and uh, look right up here. There will be a link to it uh, on uh, our YouTube channel. And if you haven't already subscribed to our YouTube channel, we do invite you to become an age-friendly champion uh, and, and join our community. You can find us on YouTube at Aging King County. That's the YouTube channel for the AAA for Seattle and King County. Uh, the AAA being 
Area Agency on Aging, which is the Aging and Disability Services Division in the Human Services Department here at the city. Uh, there is also a presentation that we did about the AAA, which uh, talks more in depth about funding and other processes and, and sort of how it all works. We're going to link it up right up here as well. So um, again, you'll join uh, this uh, August uh, 5th event in the same way you joined today, either on, on Facebook Live or on bit.ly forward slash hfriendlylive or by phone. Um, and just keep in mind that Facebook and phone options only offer English and language access is available through the regular link. Both of these programs are produced in partnership with the Seattle Public Library. The Seattle Public Library logo is there. Uh, and we've been a partner on this from 2020. Uh, now, the coffee hours have been around for longer, uh, it, probably 15 years now. And those used to be in-person events. Uh, they're currently virtual and we're hoping to move them back into the libraries, but continue providing virtual access. So sort of a hybrid model. More on that to come. Currently, they are still 100% virtual. So if we can go to the next slide, we can actually then uh, have a word from uh, the Seattle Public Library uh, representative. Uh, the Older Adults Program Manager, Nancy Sloat, who has been an amazing partner. Uh, he's, she's been a special agent in charge of age-friendly happenings uh, throughout the library. Uh, and uh, we uh, look forward to hearing exactly what is happening with the library's road to reopening. I understand a lot is happening. So at this point, I'm just gonna turn it over to you, Nancy. Uh, welcome back to the program. Uh, and take it away. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Good morning. And uh, thank you much, Lenny. And um, so I am the Older Adults Program Manager for Seattle Public Library. And um, I create programs and services to make the library age-friendly and accessible and to make sure that the programs that we're offering are of particular interest to older adults. They could be of interest to any adult as well, but just to make sure that they're really addressing issues and concerns and interests of older adults. Um, so I am going to give you a short update on uh, what's going on in the library. For those of you who have been to other uh, coffee hours, you know that I do that. I do a short, short, uh, short uh, summary of what's going on. And I also just want to say before I start how much I appreciate our partnership with Age Friendly Seattle as well. Uh, can I have the next slide? Um, so we are so, so happy. Yay, we've got 22 out of 27 branches open. Um, we're well on our way to getting back to our pre-pandemic levels. Um, some of our smallest branches aren't open yet, like New Holly or the Montlake branch, but we're working very hard to do that. We're bringing on new staff. We got some new funding from the city to um, bring up the staff to levels that we can open um, all of the buildings. Um, right now, um, there's no capacity limits in the library, 100% capacity. We still do require masks in the building and the city I know is reviewing all the guidelines to make a determination about masks in city, city buildings. So could I have the next slide? Um, you can do everything in the buildings almost that you could do before. Uh, my most favorite activity, of course, is to browse the stacks and discover new authors, particularly fiction. Um, but you can use computers. You can even borrow a laptop for use in the library. You can charge your devices. You could bring your own devices in and use our Wi-Fi. Um, you can photocopy and scan. You can ask your reference questions, pick up your holds, you name it. And, you know, for the people who have been coming back into the branches, our patrons, when we've talked to them, many people just say it is so nice to be in a library building again, just sort of to feel the ambience of the library. You can sit down, read a magazine, newspaper, read your own book work on your own device. So um, it's we're well on our way. Um, could I have the next slide? 
The one really important thing is that the branches at this point, of the 22 branches that are open, are not open every day of the week. So it's very important to either check our website at the web address that I put on the slide, which is spl.org slash road to reopening. Um, or if that's not convenient, you can call our quick information. That's our telephone reference. And they're amazing people. They know everything. I even use them sometimes when I can't find out information about the library. Um, but check on when your neighborhood branch is actually open. Uh, can I have the next slide? So uh, if you've been to some other coffee hours, you know that I've, I'm really excited about a new um, item that you can check out from the library. You can get a Discover Pass, which um, allows you access to all of the Washington State Parks and the trails and the wildlife areas. Um, and um, instead of having to buy a pass, which could be $30, $35 for a year. Um, you can actually put a pass on hold, like you could put a book on hold, um, check it out um, for two weeks and get off into uh, the wilderness and get outside, which I know everybody really wants to do. So there are limited numbers of passes, so be sure to put a hold on them. Uh, next slide, please. And then, um, Again, if you've heard me before, you know that this book bingo for adults is one of my favorite activities at the library. Um, it's our adult summer reading program. Um, we have book bingo cards in uh, Spanish and in English, and there are 25 squares, and each square has its own category of book to read, like a book that makes you laugh or a book that takes place in an Olympic city, or a graphic novel. Um, and uh, basically, you read books that fit those categories or listen to them, audiobooks, that's fine. Um, and if you get a bingo, or if you go for the blackout, you can submit your card to, um, to a library. Um, and we'll have drawings for uh, great uh, uh, gifts, which are, um, gift certificates to independent bookstores, and one grand grand prize, which is uh, two tickets to arts and lecture series for 2021, so 21-22. So get reading. Um, next slide, please. Um, and then I just want to talk a little bit about the Summer of Learning. It's, um, people may know it as um, Summer Reading for Kids. But this year and, and over the last couple of years, we've kind of evolved it. It's not just about reading because there's so many different ways to learn. And so the Summer of Learning is about learning about your story, telling about your story, telling about your family's story, finding out about it. So don't be surprised if a younger person in your life comes and asks you um, to tell uh, tell you about their early childhood and the things that are important to them. And uh, t uh, uh, youth will be able to uh, do a cool poster. You can pick it up at, the, at a branch. And then um, there's going to be free admission to the Burke Museum if you bring the poster with you all the way through um, uh, December. So it'll be great. Could I have the next slide? Um, and I just, uh, you know, what's a library without author events? Uh, we have an event coming up on July 22nd. It's Noboko Miyamoto. Um, and she is a troubadour, theater artist, musician, dancer. Um, and she uses art to affect social change. And there'll be a cool panel discussion. So please make sure to register um, for it since it's virtual. And that's, you can go right to the library's calendar at uh, spl.org slash calendar. And next slide. And I just thought people may not know this, that Seattle is a UNESCO city of literature. That's a UN um, uh, uh, department. And um, so the point of the city of literature, there are hundreds of city of literatures um, around the globe. 
And the point is to promote access and participation in the arts. And so we do programs here that are City of Literature programs. And there's a wonderful book that you can get on our website. It's called Seismic. And it's local authors talking, writing short essays on um, what it means, what it has meant for them to live in Seattle. Some of the authors I've just listed, you may be familiar, Claudia Castro Luna was um, the uh, Washington State Poet Laureate. Uh, Ken Workman is the great, 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 great uh, grandson of Chief Seattle. And there are other local authors as well. And next slide. And I just wanted to finish up to invite you to visit the older adults pages on the library's website. Um, our program is called Next Chapter. And you can get to that at spl.org slash next chapter. And then find my final slide is uh, just my contact information. Um, and I welcome you to contact me by email and um, talk to me about older adult services and what you want to see happening at the library. So thank you. And Lenny, back to you. Well, thank you so much, Nancy. Uh, we appreciate you as always. Uh, looks like the library is is getting back in there. Uh, I, I understand from previous conversations and from what I heard today is that not quite where we could have a coffee hour at the library, but you know we'll look forward to to that time. Uh, in the meantime, thank you again for being here. Thank you. All right. Well, so uh, if we could go to the next slide. Ah, here we go, our main event. This is where normally we would have uh, an update from, from me, basically, from the information that we have uh, available uh, on the state of the pandemic and on the state of vaccinations and the state of reopening. But today we won't do that because we have the experts here in the room with us. Uh, and uh, with that, uh, if we could please go to the next slide. This is who we're going to uh, meet today, uh, Dr. James Lewis and Shauna Clark. Uh, and I'm going to invite them to the stage here in a moment uh, and talk a little bit about uh, their backgrounds, uh, what I know of them. Uh, so here is uh, uh, Dr. James Lewis, and here is... Uh, Shauna Clark. So here they are. Hello, folks. Uh, I, um, you know, it's interesting. As I was reading your your bio, uh, Dr. Lewis, uh, I realized that there's quite a bit of a North Carolina connection. Um, uh, I have a bachelor's uh, uh, from UNC and and a master's from NC State. So uh, and I my first job out of college was actually uh, at a at a lab at uh, uh, UNC Medicine uh, doing behavioral stuff. Uh, so anyway, Great. I'm not the presenter today though. So Dr. James Lewis, MD, MPH, obtained his MD from the University of Arkansas uh, for medical sciences in 2010 and went on to complete internal medicine residency at Washington University in St. Louis in 2013, followed by completing a fellowship in infectious diseases, as well as a preventive medicine residency at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, Go Heels. And that was back in 2016. Uh, additionally, uh, he completed his uh, master in public health with a focus in epi epidemiology. Uh, you'll have to teach me how to say that word properly. It just never comes off the tongue yeah. for me. Um, and that was at UNC's, uh, uh, is it Gilling or Gilling? Gillings. Gilling, Gilling School of Global Public Health, thank you, uh, in 2016. So uh, after a completion of training, he remained uh, on as a clinical faculty with the Infectious Diseases Division at UNC, as well as part-time medical director uh, appointment at North Carolina Division of Public Health for the Healthcare Associated Infections, HAI, program, and subsequently the Vaccine Preventable Disease Program. A year later, he accepted a full-time position at the, as the medical director at North Carolina Division of Public Health HAI program while 
retaining adjunct fa faculty status with the UNC School of Medicine and the Gilling, Gilling School of uh, Global Public Health. Um, so Dr. Lewis uh, remained in these positions until February 2020 upon moving to Public Health Seattle and King County to assist with the COVID-19 pandemic response. So um, it sounds like you are uh, uh, a North Carolina transplant uh, and uh, it's, uh, it, you know, it's a small world, uh, I, I, I suppose, uh, though I, I did come here from North Carolina uh, a, a bit earlier uh, in the early 2000s. So wel welcome, Dr. Lewis. Um, and, uh, and the other person on our stage is Shauna Clark. And Shauna, I, I don't know as much about your, your background uh, and education, so maybe you can speak to that before we get started. Uh, but uh, what I do know is that Shauna is a registered nurse uh, here with Public Health Seattle and King County and oversees long-term care facility, LTCF, COVID-19 response program. Since King County's first COVID-19 outbreak, she has dedicated her time to supporting LTCFs in King County. Prior to the pandemic, she conducted infection control assessments for facilities in hospital-acquired infection investigations. Um, so, Shauna, Dr. Lewis, thank you for being here. Both presenters will stay on stage the whole time, and I'll come off the stage, and uh, um, they'll go through the PowerPoint and sort of take turns presenting. And then at the end of both of their presentations, we will pause for a Q&A. So uh, at this point, uh, I want to welcome you to the virtual Civic Coffee Hour. Hopefully someday uh, we can do this in person, or maybe we won't need to. Maybe public health will go uh, uh, more, more of a, uh, in the background of our lives. Certainly very important program that we partner with a lot uh, at Aging Disability Services, but certainly a lot more so in the past year and a half. So with that, uh, welcome and uh, please take it away. Thank you so much, Lenny, for having us today. Uh, next slide, please. So um, Dr. Lewis and I plan to go over uh, an introduction of our team at the Communicable Disease uh, Group with Public Health, uh, an overview of the pandemic so far, uh, and Dr. Lewis will take over um, the evolution of the vaccine distribution in long-term care facilities, the trajectory and the trajectory of the pandemic and what we can expect to see uh, possibly in the future. And then hopefully we'll have some time for a Q&A at the end. Next slide, please. So our team um, uh, with the Communicable Disease Group with Public Health, I'll just briefly describe roles and responsibilities. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so these, <clears throat> pardon me, are only a few of the programs. Um, that have really uh, come together to form our COVID-19 response. So we have the analytics and informatics team. That's essentially our data team um, and uh, reporting to the state. Uh, the public health information call center, that's typically the first contact uh, the public may have with public health. It's a call center, um, anyone can call and get information resources. Um, and it is also the first link uh, if individuals need uh, isolation and quarantine support post-COVID. Uh, we also have a contact tracing and contact investigation team. That's the team that if an individual tests positive, they'll get a call. Um, we'll gather some information to assess risks and then also provide support and recommendations. Um, and that often includes like grocery support or transportation to help uh, support the individuals that are staying home and isolating. Next uh, slide, please. So other teams include our vaccination team, which has been a huge, a huge uh, undertaking. Um, we have dedicated leads that oversee many of our sectors. Um, and uh, they've been really successful, and James will go into some of the vaccine information later in the presentation, but it's an amazing team that's well built out now. And they also have, um, so they support vaccine clinics, and then they also support mobile vaccine teams, so they can go out and support individuals that might be homebound. 
Uh, we have a testing team. Uh, they're really our subject matter experts in testing, um, and they uh, support investigations and teams uh, with um, or with all testing needs that might occur. And then investigation teams. So that's really where James and I are. Um, and our next slide will go over kind of the breakdown of our investigation teams. So next slide, please. So the COVID-19 investigation teams, those um, are really outbreak investigations. So we've broken them down into sectors. Uh, and then in each sector, we oversee uh, rep reported cases and outbreak responses. So um, our teams include healthcare team, um, which is like acute care, long-term care facilities. And that's where James and I uh, spend a lot of our time supporting that group. Uh, we also have a non-healthcare congregate setting team, um, which supports homeless service sites, corrections, and higher education. We have a workplace investigation team, which is a, a large team and has um, supports a variety of different settings. Uh, we have a death investigation team, so any uh, suspected or confirmed COVID-19 related death is investigated by this team. And then we have schools and child care teams. So this team supports kindergarten through um, 12th grade, as well as any uh, child care or daycare setting. And then lastly, we have a social events and faith-based organization team. So that's really the parties, large gatherings, weddings, funerals, that type of uh, investigation. Next slide, please. So next I'll just briefly discuss uh, what we've seen so far in the pandemic. Next slide, please. So what we've seen so far, um, you can see in the top um, graph is we have had um, 108,000 confirmed positive cases in King County. Uh, and that includes 6,550 hospitalizations that have been confirmed COVID related. And then we've had 1,672 COVID related deaths. Um, in terms of um, our aging community, uh, we were able to break down that 70.8% of hospitalizations uh, were of the age of 50 years or older. And then 98% of the deaths um, have been uh, among individuals 50 years or older. So really uh, that impact of, of um, COVID on, the, on individuals uh, uh, 50 or older has been a, a large focus for public health. Next slide, please. So um, in terms of long-term care, uh, this is a, a graph of uh, our outbreaks through the course of the pandemic. You can see the, um, the months at the bottom. The top graph are um, the actual confirmed outbreaks within facilities that we've uh, investigated. And then the bottom graph, um, the orange are confirmed staff members, and then the blue are confirmed residents of these long-term care facilities. So our team has uh, supported 514 long-term care facility outbreaks. And that includes adult family homes, assisted living, skilled nursing facilities, independent living, and also senior housing. And then uh, 5,730 confirmed cases from all of those outbreaks. And the breakdown of that is um, there's, we've identified 2,149 positive staff in long-term care, 3,474 positive residents in long-term care. And the 107 other are sometimes contractors or uh, visitors or other individuals that come and go um, from long-term care. Next slide, please. So next up is James. All right. Thanks, Shauna. And I uh, just want to say thanks for to Shauna for putting together the presentation, just like the whole uh, COVID response, especially in long-term care, couldn't have done it without her. Just like I couldn't have done this presentation without her. So thanks a lot. Uh, we can go ahead and move on to the next slide. We're going to talk about the vaccine rollout, the different types of vaccines, and how uh, vaccination is going right now. 
So just for everybody's uh, reference, there are three currently approved uh, vaccines in the United States. Two of them are the mRNA-based vaccines, which is a, a new type of vaccine technology that seems to be working very well. Uh, the Pfizer and Moderna. Uh, both of them require two injections. Uh, the Pfizer can be done three weeks apart and the Moderna four weeks apart. And Pfizer has obtained uh, extra approval to uh, be administered to uh, people 12 years and older. And Moderna has applied for that, but currently is 18 years and older. But they, we hope to hear by the beginning of August that it will be approved for 12 years and older. They've submitted their application for approval. And sorry if you hear my email dinging there. Then there's the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, which is a, a more similar type of vaccine uh, that folks here or that may you, you may be used to, such as like a measles vaccine and things like that. It uses a viral vector and it's a single injection and currently that is also only recommended for 18 years and older. I do not know when or if it will be approved uh, for 12 and above uh, or even younger eventually, hopefully. You can go ahead and move on to the next slide. Okay, so here's some information. I'll go over the, the figures there in just a second, but I just want to talk a little bit about how um, uh, vaccine rollout started uh, for COVID in, in our area and really more broadly. So nationwide, it started out with a federal pharmacy vaccination program. Uh, this was targeted at long-term care facilities and uh, the pharmacies then were able to directly provide vaccines to long-term care facilities and they were uh, done in two to three visits to complete vaccinations for all staff and residents. And a lot of this was because the vaccines um, are a little bit tricky, especially the Moderna and Pfizer vaccine and the way they have to be stored. And so um, that's why we couldn't just ship them directly to the long-term care facilities. When that pharmacy partnership ended, facility vaccination rates dropped due to staff turnover and resident movement. Uh, and so there was not a great way to get vaccines back into long-term care facilities to keep those vaccination rates up. So the King County vaccination team which, uh, as Shauna mentioned, has done a really amazing job. In fact, our vaccination rates here in King County are uh, at one point the best and maybe still the best in the entire country when you look at it on a county level basis. Uh, so they established a partnership with hospital systems, uh, the state uh, and the state Department of Health and fire department to provide interim mobile vaccine support to deliver vaccines to long term care facilities. And as the long-term care facility vaccination need, needs were being met, public health vaccine teams moved to support vaccination of homebound seniors. This is done with supportive partners who provide mobile vaccination to those individuals and anyone in the home who is interested. So you don't have to be a senior to, to take advantage of that. If you're in the home where a homebound senior lives, then you can get vaccinated using that uh, process. Now, uh, we've made some headway in getting more reliable access to vaccines in long-term care facilities. So pharmacies are again set up to provide vaccine doses to facilities. As most long-term care facilities have a partnership with a uh, pharmacy, uh, we were able to, with a lot of help from the Department of Health, uh, uh, develop those partnerships to be able to deliver vaccine. Um, and this can be done with mobile vaccine team for the facility where the uh, or that the facilities uh, providers such as nurses and physicians can pick up doses. Um, and uh, some kinks are still being worked out with this and public health is actively supporting facilities in need with our previous mobile vaccination efforts. And um, if you take a look at the figures here, you can kind of see how the uh, vaccine kind of rollout is doing. So you can see there at the beginning of the year, uh, these are the number of doses on this left hand side, the graph, the bar graph with lots of small bars. Uh, it was very limited at first. We were only administering doses to, uh, to our seniors here in King County, and then we opened it up further and you see the rate and the community went up. And now, unfortunately, the rate is going down. Some of that is because we do have a very good vaccination rate, and so there's less people to vaccinate. And in fact, at this point, we are at 73.7% uh, of all eligible uh, citizens in King County have been uh, vaccinated for, uh, have received two doses or their um, final dose, which is one dose for the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. And then as of this week, 50 to 59 year old age range has 81.5% uh, of folks have completed two doses. And so soon all of them will be completely vaccinated, which is two weeks after. 60 to 69 year, uh, year olds uh, were at 86.2%. 
And at 70 plus years, we are doing excellent. And again, this is one of the best in the country. We have over 95% of those individuals um, who have received both doses and, and very close to 95%, if not more, are fully vaccinated, meaning they're two weeks out from their final dose of vaccine. So we can go ahead and move on to the next slide. And uh, just to show that we really know vaccination reduces outbreaks in long-term care facilities uh, and really you know, prevents serious illness in, the, in individuals who get infected with COVID-19 or prevents infection with COVID-19. We just wanted to show you these graphs here and sorry for our wavy highlighted lines, but just to give you a reference point of uh, when you know, we were able to um, uh, start the vaccine rollout process, you can see there that on the left-hand side, this is the number of cases over the entire pandemic uh, over time. So that's on a weekly basis. Each of those bars is a, is a week. And so you can see we started giving uh, vaccines there where, that, uh, where the highlighted uh, line is, you know, more widespread and uh, particularly in seniors. And uh, then in the top right graph, you can see uh, the amount of vaccines that were given on a, on a weekly basis. And in the bottom right, you can see those are the counts of actual long-term care facility outbreaks that we investigated, our team investigated. And so you can see that you know dramatically dropped off. It dropped off actually a little soon for it to be completely due to vaccine, but it definitely played a huge role. And another big thing that's not really shown well in this uh, bottom right graph is that even though we did still see some outbreaks in long-term care facilities, the number of cases associated with those outbreaks, uh, with each outbreak, was substantially decreased. So even if you see uh, a week where maybe later during the um, spring surge here, the the third third wave um, or fourth wave, excuse me, um, uh, got up to five outbreaks, whereas you know six months prior to that, you might see. Uh, 20, 30 cases per outbreak. On these, you would see closer to, you know, three to five cases per outbreak. So we really know that um, that vaccines work to prevent illness in long-term care facilities and among people in the community. You can go ahead and move on to the next slide. So just talk a little bit about the trajectory and what we anticipate for the future. Uh, which is going to be a little hard to predict, given I'm sure everybody's aware of the Delta variant has been a lot in the news, but I'll, I'll give my best guess of the situation, but don't hold me to it. That could change next week. We can go ahead and move to the next slide. So what we fully expect to see is, a, especially in our seniors where we have really good vaccination coverage and in long-term care facilities, we expect to see a continued decline in, in COVID-19 cases as vaccine uptake increases and is, and is maintained, assuming that that remains the case. Um, in the community, that can be different because even though we have done an excellent job and the vaccine team here in King County is, is pr probably the best in the country, if not one of the best in the country, uh, we do still have uh, pockets of, our, of our, our county where there are communities with low vaccine uptake, unfortunately. And so we still have a lot of work to do and we're not slacking off just because we've done a good job so far. Uh, and so we do anticipate to still see some outbreaks in the community, uh, especially now with Delta variant, which is much more easily uh, spread uh, and transmitted between individuals. So we do fully expect to see some uh, outbreaks, possibly some large outbreaks in the community, but hopefully in long term care facilities, we will not see uh, a large number of outbreaks. And when we, where we do see outbreaks, hopefully the numbers will stay low, which is what we have seen so far. Uh, so that's very good. And we also expect to see lower rates of severe illness um, due to vaccine because no vaccine is 100% effective and you can still get infected even if you get vaccinated. Uh, but the people who get infected after they receive a vaccine are generally, much, like vast majority of them are, are, have either no symptoms or very mild symptoms. So that is, is very good. Uh, we will continue to monitor for variants of concern. Right now, the biggest one is the Delta variant, which has been in the news, um, but we fully expect that there will be other variants of concern that pop up. Uh, hopefully none of them are worse than Delta variant, but we will be monitoring that for that closely. And then we will certainly have a potential for a surge in the fall uh, due to more people moving indoors where transmission is more likely. Uh, and uh, schools reopening, um, and and then also with the kind of likely co-circulation of the flu, given that uh, 
mitigation measures such as mask wearing and uh, business closures, et cetera, will not be what they were last fall. Uh, there will be much much less of that this fall. And so uh, whereas we saw very little uh, flu activity last year, um, if that is the case this fall, we, we expect um, at least a normal flu season, if not a worse than usual flu season, which could affect COVID transmission as well. So that's just something to be aware of. So I'll go ahead and stop there. Sorry, we don't have quite as much time for questions as we had planned, um, but hopefully we can still get some in. Awesome. Well, thank you. Back to Lewis and thank you, Shauna. Uh, and if you're watching us online, you, you'll see uh, contact information for Shauna and Dr. Lewis. Uh, Shauna is at shclark at kingcounty.gov and Dr. Lewis is at jame lewis at kingcounty.gov. All right. So uh, with that, uh, I'm going to turn it over to one of the uh, moderators in the studio, our, uh, our newest team member, uh, Jody Wong, uh, and see if uh, she could uh, uh, read off the question that came through. So uh, Jody, uh, welcome to the program. Uh, what question uh, came through there in the Q and A? Yeah, so we did have one question. Um, so do you guys have any thoughts on the booster shots? Sure, I can do that. I think, um, Lani, sorry, uh, Shauna's muted. Um, she had muted herself before, if you could unmute her. But uh, I, can, I can talk about that. I do think that uh, booster shots are, likely to be recommended at least for certain um, members of the community, particularly those with uh, immune compromising conditions such as uh, different types of cancer, potentially HIV, things like that, uh, other autoimmune diseases like uh, rheumatoid arthritis or uh, things like that. Uh, that will probably be the first group I would imagine to get recommended to get a booster shot, but uh, I would not be surprised if more uh, people, even the general community at large, is recommended to get a booster shot eventually, but I don't have a uh, idea of when that might occur. Uh, looks like the, the person, it could be a different person because it comes through anonymous, you really can't tell who's asking, but looked like there was a follow-up uh what is the time frame and it sounds like there's not uh you're not aware of of the actual time frame shauna no not aware of the time frame at this point there hasn't been a formal recommendation at least got it got it um while um while we're uh waiting for more questions to come in i i uh, was listening to um Seattle now on KOW, and they had a topic about breakthrough infections. Uh, is that something that you're seeing a lot of, any at all? Yeah, I can I can uh, take a first step. We are definitely seeing that, and we expected to see vaccine breakthrough infections. As I, I think I mentioned when I was talking, there are no vaccines that are 100% effective, uh, and so people are going to still get infected despite being vaccinated. And we are not seeing, um, you know, an unexpected number of vaccine breakthrough cases. In fact, uh, the number of vaccine breakthrough cases is lower than what we may have anticipated based on the reported efficacy of the vaccine. So no bad news there. Uh, and then the good news is, is the vaccine breakthrough cases we are seeing, uh, the you know, huge majority, the vast majority are mild or asymptomatic illness. So um, uh, the vaccine does appear to be working very well. And it appears that it works well against the Delta variant, which is quickly becoming the predominant variant here in, in uh, Seattle, King County, the, the United States and the world at large. So. Yeah, sounds like it's uh, spreading pretty quickly um, and the vaccination is important. Uh, we do have another question that came through. I'm going to uh, go over to Justin for, for that one. Uh, Justin, welcome to the program. Thank you for your work in the background here. Uh, what is the question that we see in the Q&A? Great. Thanks, Lenny. Uh, there's actually two questions that have come in. Um, the first one, in King County, where vaccination rates are high among older people, there are still many groups of older adults that are hesitant to get vaccinated. What strategies do you use to prompt hesitant people to go get a vaccine? I can uh, answer that one. 
We actually uh, have, have recognized the hesitancy from the beginning um, and uh, really education is the key um, that we're focusing on. And so we do have a, a new team to the vaccination and policy group who um, are just dedicated to older adults and hesit hesitancy. So if you have a, a, a scenario that you're interested in having a representative from public health come and sit with you, they'll sit in like a lunchroom or a cafeteria or join you to just be available to answer questions, um, provide resources, and then if and when uh, that group or a few individuals decide to move forward with vaccination, um, that team can also coordinate uh, support uh, to get vaccination out to those individuals. Great, thanks. Uh, the second question that came in, um, what do you suggest if I go to a state with a low vaccination rate, such as Missouri or Arkansas? Would you recommend masking? Well, um, we would it's certainly while you're traveling. So I'm assuming if you're going to, and I'm actually from Arkansas originally, where I got my MD, so uh, I am fully aware that they are not having a rough time right now. Um, you know, certainly while you're traveling, it is still recommended during any any public transportation that you should be masking, even here in Washington, where we have pretty good vaccination rates and in, in King County, where we have excellent vaccination rates. Uh, once you get there, I think that would be a personal decision if you're vaccinated. Uh, the, the risk of illness to yourself is low, or at least uh, severe illness or, or symptomatic illness, even the risk is low. But we do know that uh, transmission can occur from uh, vaccinated people who get vaccine breakthrough infections. And so uh, we certainly would not discourage anyone from wearing a mask, especially if you're in a situation where you're in close contact with someone uh, in an indoor setting. Uh, and particularly if you know that individual is, is not vaccinated. Uh, we wouldn't discourage it, but it's not it's not a public health recommendation at this time because the vaccines do work so well. Uh, and so right now, the public health recommendations are really focusing and putting the onus on individuals, number one, to try and get people to get vaccinated and uh, uh, that people who choose not to get vaccinated are really putting that risk on themselves. But from a public health standpoint, uh, where you're thinking about populations, um, Wearing a mask could certainly reduce the risk of, of transmission on a population level. All right, great. One last question that just came through. I'm not seeing any others in the chat after this one. Uh, going forward, do you have any thoughts on how to convince those young people who think they're invincible from COVID-19? I think we have similar task forces uh, working on uh, vaccine hesitant populations in general on the vaccine team. Chana, do you know any more about the other groups like the one you just mentioned for um, older adults? Yeah, not specifically, um, just because I'm more linked with the, the older adults, but I do know that they're doing education support, especially through um, social media outlets to try to target individuals um, that are younger and maybe uh, hesitant or have misinformation about the vaccine. It's all focused around the education piece, informed decisions. And increasing ease of use, e e accessibility, increasing accessibility. So for instance, one thing I know that has been done, there's lots of community events where you can get vaccinated for instance, in the um, Mariner Stadium, they have uh, at least one, but I think it's two or three uh, vaccination stations where folks can get vaccinated. And then if you get vaccinated while you're there, you can get a, uh, a little, um, you know, gift bag of treats. And that's all we got, right, uh, Justin, for now? It appears so. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, um, well, actually, um, it's, uh, while we're still here, uh, I do have a couple of follow-ups. Staying with uh, with uh, the young people question, you know, we're age-friendly Seattle, which is, you know, making communities better to grow up and grow old, right? So we are we we know that uh, children under twelve are not currently eligible. So so that you know, um, you, you may have heard a, a little voice here in, in my apartment where I'm broadcasting from. Um, so we know that he is not eligible right now. So we're careful because of him. Uh, 
and, and that seems to be, you know, the I, I remember seeing on coronavirus.wa.gov, which is usually the, the, the website that we provide is, uh, you know, life after vaccine. You know, what does it mean if somebody in your household is not eligible? Basically, what the recommendation was, treat your household as unvaccinated. And it was kind of a surprising kind of a statement to read for me. Uh, I mean, I don't mind, but I, I, I'm just curious what your thoughts are on that. And how quickly do you think we'll get to be able to vaccinate kids under 12, especially considering they're going back to school in person? John, just since you have young kids at home, too, I don't know if you have to share your thoughts first. I have yeah. some, too. Um. I think really the the motto, and we use this in, in long-term care as well, is like those individuals that are unvaccinated are at highest risk. So um, the idea being with having in young children at home or in you know other public spaces, trying to maintain a, um, a safe environment for them. So all individuals within that close contact or home or a gathering, um, would uh, participate in mask use or definitely uh, increased hand hygiene and kind of maintaining all of the infection prevention measures as if everyone would be at risk to protect the, those that are unvaccinated. But I know there's a lot of discussions happening right now uh, with the planning of uh, children going back to school and what that will look like. Um, and I, I don't have any information on next steps um, for vaccination under 12. Do you know, James? Well, I know they're actively, you know, examining that and they want to get the, um, I don't know what phase the trials are in looking at vaccinations for younger folks, but that will happen eventually. I don't know a timeline for it, but, you know, it's all happened pretty quickly. So uh, I would say um, I wouldn't be surprised if it happened, you know, first quarter of next year, but uh, I don't know. I would I would be a little surprised if it happened much sooner than that, but maybe by the end of the year. That's all just a guess, though, so don't quote me on it. Uh, but as far as the, in addition to everything Shauna said, I think part of the reason why um, that approach is being taken is modeling the behavior for the children uh, or, or really even adults that um, uh, don't get vaccinated. Um, you know, I think especially for young kids, though, it would be really hard to continue wearing masks whenever, you know, you go out and you see a lot of other people not wearing masks, especially if your family isn't wearing masks. It would be, uh, I'm, I mean, I don't have children of my own, but I would imagine uh, it would be hard to kind of convince them that that was something that uh, is beneficial to them and, and everybody around them if their family isn't doing it too, or the people that they look up to or, or um, you know, interact with. So that was a big part of the reason as well. So just modeling that behavior um, for those those kids. Well, thank you for addressing that. I think uh, uh, the grandparents that are watching right now who are likely vaccinated, uh, you know, they, they're they concerned for their grandkids. Our, on our last program um, two weeks ago, and we'll link it up right here, we, we met uh, a kinship care provider, grandmothers caring for grandchildren. And I think, uh, uh, you know, a, a lot of the time, they're the sole caregivers. So uh, um, thank you for addressing that. Uh, there was a question for the library, and it was a really quick question Do does the Discover Pass have to be, um, can it be ordered online and do you have to come into the library to open it? Let me bring Nancy back to the stage uh, quickly for sort of a yes or no uh, answer on that. Um, yeah, so you actually are going to, phys you, you're going to put it on hold um, through the library catalog, um, either do it yourself or um, you can call Quick Information and they can put it on hold for you. And then you're actually going to physically pick up the pass. You won't be able to download it from the state website. Cool. Thank you, Nancy. It is amazing that you can get a pass for free and, and then go enjoy the outdoors now that we're encouraged to do so. So, um, and we can do so without masks safely, right? Unless it's a huge crowd, right? Um, so, um, thank you for clarifying that, Nancy. Uh, and thank you for sticking around uh, uh, until now. Appreciate you. So, uh, uh, so, so Shauna and, and Dr. Lewis, uh, thank you both very much. This is uh, uh, an evolving situation. Uh, I appreciate you 
sort of acknowledging that uh, and providing information as it stands today. Our first coffee hour provided virtually was with Public Health Seattle and King County. Um, and uh, the information has changed and our approach to, to how, you know, certainly has evolved, right? Uh, so we really appreciate getting a glimpse into, you know, the inner workings of public health. Uh, and, and we so much appreciate your efforts. King County really is the leader nationwide um, on, on vaccinations. And certainly there's vaccine hesitancy still in our community. Uh, um, I, I sit on a, a refugee advisory council for uh, Washington State, and, and we're currently um, uh, are aware of hesitancy in particular uh, refugee and immigrant communities, uh, including former Soviet Union, which is where um, you know I'm from. That's a, I'm a former refugee from USSR, and so um, it, it's it's a tough uh, tough issue, uh, uh, but it's an important one. And, and I think if we uh, work together uh, and and sort of provide reasons for, for people uh, to, to get vaccinated. Uh, I think eventually uh, it is going to be possible to, to, to make a difference. Um, thank you again for being here. Uh, usually with panels, we say, are there any sort of final words um, that you would like to leave our audience with? Um, just, you know, thanks for getting vaccinated and thanks for being here and learning and, and bear with us. I'm sure that, you know, uh, guidance will continue to evolve as the situation evolves and um, uh, we'll all get through it together. And where is the best place for folks to get the guidance? Is it the King County site, the Washington State site, uh, the city site? Um, yeah, I, I, all of those and also CDC. Um, uh, I would say um, for the most up to date recommendations from a nationwide level CDC, because we have to play catch up when CDC updates their guidance. Um, but certainly for anything locally, uh, King County's website would be best and we do our best to keep that you know, as up to date as possible. Excellent. And we'll provide that link as well. Uh, thank you both, Dr. Lewis and Shauna, uh, for being here. We're going to uh, end it here. Um, uh, if we could go uh, to the next slide, please. I want to invite uh, all of you uh, in the audience to come back uh, for the next coffee hour. Please save the date. It's Thursday, the 19th of August. We'll have a return appearance from the... Seattle Department of Transportation Director, Sam Zimbabwe. Um, we have recently been conducting some outreach to uh, age-restricted communities around Seattle. And we've asked, you know, what are the topics that you're interested in? And transportation has always come out on top. So uh, because of that, uh, and also because we usually get an update uh, about once a year from SDOT, uh, there is uh, something that they're doing uh, to help Seattle bounce back, to revitalize the downtown area. They're issuing special permits uh, for businesses to have outside seating where parking normally would be. They're looking to continue that program into 2022, but they want to they wanna hear your feedback on that. Uh, we have been posting about it on social media and sending it to our email list and put it in the description of the video. Again, uh, uh, bit.ly forward slash age friendly live, each word is capitalized. And remember, community living connections uh, is your uh, one place. Uh, it's a no wrong door approach. If you find a, uh, an organization in the community um, and, and you're walking in there, uh, but they don't, for example, speak your language, uh, they will refer you to an organization that does speak your language or does provide the service that you're uh, looking for. Their number is 1-844-348-5464 and their website is communitylivingconnections.org where you can find the organizations in your community that can be helpful. Thank you again so much for joining us. Uh, if you like this video, go ahead and give it a like. Go ahead and uh, uh, subscribe to our channel and become a, a member of uh, Age Friendly Champions community. And we'll see you all next time. Uh, please uh, enjoy the great outdoors. Uh, uh, and indoors safely, and, and we will see you all later. Thank you. <laughs>